Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So as we begin, let me remind you, we have just begun a series in the Gospel of Mark, and Mark has already revealed to us that Jesus is Messiah. He is the Son of God. And when he was speaking concerning this, that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God, that was a way of revealing to us that Jesus Christ is royalty. He's the Son of the King of the universe. And I was mentioning to you last time we were together, as kings did during Mark's day, Jesus had someone who went before him. This was a messenger. A messenger who would prepare the way for the king, who would herald his coming. The messenger who would proclaim that the king was about to arrive and uh, would make sure that all the roads that the king would travel on were ready. In Luke chapter 1, verse 17, it says, He, speaking of John, will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John was not simply overseeing the clearing of debris from a road. He was calling people to personally clear out the debris of their lives. He was preaching what was called a message of repentance. He was baptizing those who repented. And all the while, he was pointing people to the one who was about to come to them. Well, at that point, he had yet to arrive, but John was saying that his arrival was very soon. So in this section, Mark is going to present Jesus' baptism as a kind of royal coronation. And John had said that he was unworthy to stoop to unstrap his sandals while the one who is about to come is that great of a figure. And so it says in verse 9, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, when you read your Bible, some things may pass you by, and so I want to take a moment to kind of develop a few things with you about that, because that's a simple statement. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. We've all heard that before. We need to know the background and know a little bit about this. You see, by this time, John had been preaching and baptizing for several months. And as John was performing his ministry, at the right time, Jesus came to John. Now, Mark says that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, he was saying this to a non-Jewish reader so that they would understand that Jesus was coming from the north, the place called Nazareth. Nazareth is located in northern Israel. Nazareth is a home, or was a home, of Mary and Joseph. It was a small, inconsequential town. It was populated by a, a fairly large Gentile population, at least percentage-wise. You see, Gentiles were recognized as pagans. They were outside of God's promises. And Paul made that clear when he was writing to the Ephesians in Ephesians 2, verse 12. He said to them, a Gentile church, he said, remember that at that time, you Gentiles, you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and with the, without God in the world. So the Gentiles were separated from. They didn't have a relationship with God. God had a special covenantal relationship with Israel, but he did not have that same relationship with Gentiles, and therefore the Gentiles were outside of the promises of God. Well, because Nazareth had a, percentage-wise, a large amount of Gentiles living there, it also had a poor reputation. Remember in John, in chapter 1, verses 45 and 46, how Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Well, during this time, to call someone a Nazarene was to say that he was despised. They were rejected. 
They were not regarded. Why? Because, again, they were, uh, there were a lot of, of uh, pagan Gentiles who lived in Nazareth and the surrounding area. It was a small, small city. It was a, more of a village. Nazareth had uh, a population, according to some commentators, many actually, of around 150 residents. And so, one, they were despised because it was filled with pagans, and two, it was a small, inconsequential city. No one would think that such a city would produce anything or anyone that was noteworthy. It was just that inconsequential. It was, it was that uh, unimportant. Many years ago now, many years, we had a, um, an outreach. Actually, not even that. It was Wednesday night. It's a Wednesday night study, and we, uh, in our earlier days, rented Ontario uh, High School. And uh, we'd, we would rent Ontario High School on Sunday mornings, and uh, we would use the, um, the high school for our Wednesday nights as well as our Sunday nights for a while. And on one occasion, I contacted my pastor, Chuck Smith, and I said, Pastor, could you come out and do uh, a, a midweek for us? Would you come out and, and teach on a Wednesday? And Chuck said he would. And so we were there at Ontario High School. It sat 1,200 people. This was back in the, in the early 80s. And, uh, well, Chuck was coming out, so a lot of people wanted to hear him, people who didn't want to hear me. But anyway, uh, people, so Chuck was coming out, and the whole place was full, and they were sitting on the carpet, and Pastor Chuck came and gave a Bible study. It was a great Bible study and, and all. And, and we were walking, he and I were walking out. And I'll never forget this. As we were walking out the front door, walking towards the, the, the parking lot, under his breath, Chuck said, who would have ever thought Ontario? And I thought, that's really true. Who would have ever thought? God moves where he wants to move. But I remember that. It was un to him, it was like the farthest. It was like, what's going on out here? God was doing a wonderful thing. Well, sometimes people will look at cities and say they're inconsequential. But just because they may be, in the eyes of man, inconsequential doesn't mean that God can't do something there. And that's what was happening there in Nazareth. You see, Jesus came from this village. Even as Nazareth was disrespected, it was despised. It was even rejected. So was Jesus. In Isaiah 53, verse 3, it says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, we esteemed him not. So it was appropriate that Lord Jesus Christ would come out of an insignificant village. And the fact that he did would be a surprise to those who were religious leaders. They would have expected Messiah to come from a significant and a prestigious city. They would have expected Messiah to come from Jerusalem. But God has a way of taking what seems to be insignificant, and he uses it for his glory. In 1 Corinthians 1, 28 and 29, it says, God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of of God. You may see yourself as insignificant, and many of us do. You may see yourself as not having anything noteworthy about you, but God doesn't see you the way that sometimes you see yourself. Never forget that. Never forget that. God can use you. Why can't he? You have to get into the habit of doing what I've been doing for a long time. I've asked the question, why can't he? Why can't he use me? Why can't he move through me? Why can't he? What would keep him from doing that? And there are a lot of believers who unfortunately think, oh, he can use somebody else, but he can't use me. And that's not true. God uses a lot of people that you wouldn't even think were candidates to be used by him. And sometimes we get discouraged. And sometimes we think that we're not noteworthy. Well, we don't need to be noteworthy to the world because God has taken note of you. And God can do a work through you. You just ask yourself, why can't he use me? Now, there may be reasons at the moment that he can't because there may be something that's stopping him. Deal with that. And then say, Lord, here am I. Use me. Like Isaiah, when he saw the Lord, he was high and lifted up. The train of his, of his robe had filled the temple. And, and he said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of, of a people with unclean lips. And, and God took, uh, an angel took the, uh, a coal from the fire, put it on his lips and said, he said, go for me. 
and do something for me. And God can do that for you too. Never forget that. And even though Jesus came out of a, a, of a city, Nazareth, that was not regarded, it was despised. He too was disregarded and despised. And he came out of Nazareth and he had ministry that we all to this day are so grateful for. Now notice how it says in verse 9 that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. When you look at a map of Israel, the Jordan River is, the, is in eastern Israel. And just to give you a little ge geography for this, uh, it, it's fed by three main tributaries that are coming from the north. One of the uh, tributaries is known as the Hezvani. It's on the western slope of Mount Hermon. And there's another one that's called the Springs of Ladon. And then there's a third. It's Banyas or Panias, they call it. And that's four miles east of the Springs of Ladon. And the thing is, as we go up to Banyas, it's actually Banyas, we go there because that's where the Lord Jesus Christ had asked the question, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am in Caesarea Philippi? Well, John was busy ministering his baptism when Jesus came to him. The fact that John was baptizing Jews was in and of itself unusual. You see, Jews would practice various ritual washings, including individual, they call it mikvah, individual washings. Well, baptism wasn't something that the Jews would have completely understood because only Gentile converts to Judaism would receive this kind of baptism. And that would be, as they were receiving the baptism, that would have been a confession that they were no better than Gentile pagans. So to submit to John's baptism was to admit that you're a sinner. It was to confess that you were forsaking your wicked ways. It was to admit that you were in need of Messiah. But here comes Jesus. And the question has to be asked, well, why would he need to be baptized? You see, again, John was, was used to baptizing sinners. They were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. And as they came, according to verse 5, they were confessing their sins. They were openly demonstrating themselves to be sinners and, and recognizing that by being baptized. But here comes Jesus, a man with no sins to confess. Now, as you look at that for a moment, I want to develop this with you. We need to remember that John was born to godly parents. His mama's name was Elizabeth. His father's name was Zacharias. Both of them were from priestly lineage. They were descendants of Aaron. They were of the tribe of Levi. That's where the priests came from. Now, John would have been aware of who Jesus was because Jesus was John's cousin. And undoubtedly, John's parents would have told him of, of Mary becoming pregnant by the Holy Ghost without having a sexual relationship with Joseph. He would have been aware of that. He would have been also aware, undoubtedly, of some things related to him, but he hadn't actually met him, it would seem. You see, according to Luke 180, John grew up in the wilderness from early childhood. That would have been what is called the Judean wilderness. That's in the south. That's 100 miles south of Galilee, 100 miles south of Nazareth. That would mean, and I'm developing this with you, that would mean that he most likely would not have physically seen Jesus, or if he had ever seen him, he hadn't seen him in quite some time. In John 1.31, John said, I myself did not know him. The word know is a Greek word that means I didn't recognize him. So it would seem that either he had, hadn't personally met him or it had been so long that he didn't recognize him. He had said, I, I have been sent to preach, preparing people to meet him, but I myself never met him. I'm preparing you to meet Messiah, a man I have yet to meet myself. So I'm simply being obedient to the commission I'm waiting for the results. <laughs> that reminds me of something. We'll be looking at this upcoming Wednesday in the book of Job as we close out the book of Job. It reminds me of something that Job said when God was speaking to him. It says in Job chapter 42, verse 5, Job said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. I have been walking by faith and not by sight. I've been taught the things of who you are, the works that you have done, I have heard these things, I've embraced these things, I've walked by these things. These are the things that have filled my life and directed my footsteps. But I've never had a personal knowledge or encounter with you 
until now, when the Lord was revealing himself to him through a series of questions and in a way to bring humility to his life. And there are a lot of people who, who have heard of him with the hearing of the ear, but they haven't had a personal encounter with him. Now, John was aware of who Jesus was. It's not that John was uh, a sinful man in and of itself. As a man, he was sinful, but he wasn't, a, he wasn't a practicing sinner by any means. He walked in the Holy Spirit, but he was somebody who still needed a Savior. And, and so he's somebody who's aware of who Jesus is. He's heard things of Jesus undoubtedly, but he has a relationship with him in, in that personal way yet. And so John, being a preacher of righteousness, he has been sent to prepare our people to meet Messiah, has, has been telling the people that judgment is coming. You need to repent. And he had even said in Matthew 3, verse 8, he had said, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Your, your, your lives demonstrate, they're to demonstrate that you've turned from your sin to God. Again, spend a moment with that thought. Bear fruit that demonstrates true repentance. It's not just saying, I'm sorry. A sense of sorrow is, is appropriate very often, but it's deeper than that. It's a sense of, I am a, I'm a worm and not a man. It's a sense of, I am I'm altogether worthy of, of judgment. Uh, I, I'm an evil person. I need help. I need God. I, if there's anything that I think is, is missing in in the church today, it's a healthy sense of a need for God. I'll be honest with you. I think there are a lot of Christians who um, have failed to understand that. I, I wrote something on Facebook years ago now, and I had said, you know, something about repentance, and you, I got the weirdest response from a, a pastor who was angry at me for telling people that they need to repent or that we need to repent. He said, you take Scripture out of context, and... You, you know, how, how dare you be saying that Christians need to repent? And, and yet I, I had to write back to him as a pastor, and I had to tell him, you realize, of course, that repentance is a daily thing. You realize that we are, we are not 100% perfect, and that daily we need to yield to the Lord and say, God, continue your work in me. I'm sorry for what I've done. Unless anybody here yesterday didn't sin, you probably are doing that already today. God help me. Now, it, it, you were, yeah, it's, it's a fact, you know, yeah, if you didn't sin yesterday, I need you as my Savior. See, the fact is, is we sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not a single perfect person in this room outside of me. And so, with that knowledge, but it's true, isn't it? It's true. You know, we need to walk in the Spirit of God, and it's, it's, it's just obvious that we don't make it. We sin in word, thought, and deed. That is, that is human nature. Do we want to? That's a different question. It's not that you want to, but, uh, you know, but there are things sometimes you're inclined to and you can yield to, and that's why you say, God, forgive me, a sinner. And so John knew that he himself was a sinful man, especially when Christ is walking up to him. So what does he do? Well, he tries to stop Jesus. Now, Mark doesn't tell us this, but Matthew does. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, it says, Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan, to be baptized by him, and John tried to prevent him. When Matthew said John tried, the Greek word means he tried insistently. He kept on trying to prevent him, to stop him. And he said, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me? I mean, when he saw Christ come, he was insistent, no, I'm a sinner. I know that you're not. It seemed wrong for Jesus to receive a baptism that was intended for sinners. Instead of him baptizing Jesus, John knew that, in fact, he should be the one baptized by Christ. As incredible as he was, John knew he's a sinner and that Jesus wasn't. In Hebrews 7, 26, it says, It was fitting that we should have such a high priest, speaking of Jesus, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. John didn't want to baptize Jesus. He kept insisting that Jesus should baptize him. You see, Jesus made it clear that his being baptized was necessary. He says this is to fulfill all righteousness. In Matthew 3.15, Jesus replied, let it, be, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. It is necessary for me to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Now, what does that mean? How would all righteousness be fulfilled by him being baptized? 
Well, when in the Old Testament, you'll find this interesting, I would hope. In the Old Testament, the priests eligible to offer sacrifices were to be 30 years of age. In the book of Numbers, chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Take a head count of the Kohathites, Kohathites, who are part of the Levites by their clans and patriarchal houses, of those 30 years of age until 50 years of age, all who are eligible for performing assigned tasks in the workforce pertaining to the tent of meeting. And so these were to begin their ministry at the age of 30. According to Luke 3.23, Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. So Jesus waited until he was 30 to be baptized into the sacrificial priesthood. That demonstrated that he was submitted to the requirements of the law of Moses. And he had said in Matthew 5.17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. And so he was submitted to the law of Moses. Second, his, his being baptized by John identified him as Messiah to John as well as others. And because of this, God made it clear, made a way uh, for John to know clearly who Jesus was. Again, in John 1.31, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Now, Mark 1.7 says, there comes one after me who is mightier than I. He didn't identify the one by name. He did not say Jesus is coming. He's Messiah. And that would be because John did not yet know that Jesus was Messiah. So it fulfilled all righteousness by Jesus placing his seal of approval on John. Now again, John's mother and father were old. Elizabeth, his mother, was unable to have children. Zacharias, the older man, prayed fervently for a child to be given to them. And so when the angel Gabriel told Zacharias his wife would become pregnant, and <laughs> you've got to be kidding, he doubted. Gabriel told Zacharias, Elizabeth is going to bear a son. You shall call his name John. Now, here's something for you, another little thing that I think is beautiful. John is translated, God is gracious. God is gracious. Now, John was the last of the Old Testament prophets, so it is significant that grace preceded our Messiah. In John 1.16, of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. When John was eight days old, in accordance with Jewish law, John was circumcised. And at that time, his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied over his son. In Luke 1, 76 and 77, he said, You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. The father prophesied over the son. Very briefly, I'll say this. As I was reading that, I thought, how beautiful it would be if we fathers did the same for our kids. You know, I had four children. We had four. We still do. I shouldn't say had. We have four. And when my son Joseph was born, maybe I, had, I wasn't planning on saying this, but I'll say it very quickly. I should probably say it this way. We had Corinne, and we had David, and we didn't give up. We thought, well, maybe we'll have a good kid. And so, <laughs> just to see if you're awake. No, we had my Corinne, and we had our David. But then, shortly after Marie had given birth to David, she suffered a miscarriage. Now, for me, as a, a young father, under so much pressure when Maria told me that she was pregnant. Maybe some of you fathers might relate somehow to this. When Marie said, I'm pregnant, I wasn't happy. I, I wasn't happy. I thought, oh my goodness. You know, it's like I'm in a pool holding two children and I'm drowning and you're going to drop a third one on me? And so I was thinking, oh no, Lord, I, I know, I know. 
I know how all this happens and everything, but, and I wasn't happy. And then I still remember, and I hope this isn't too personal, but I, I still remember Marie coming out of the bathroom in her hand. She was holding our Miss. a child and she had this look on her face and she came out with her baby forgive me I shouldn't have told you the story we lost our child and I, I felt terrible because I had gotten to the point of saying this is a blessing to have a baby and I had gotten to that point and Instead of the shock of saying, oh my goodness, we have. And so, later on, obviously, she became pregnant again. And this was Joseph. And when Joseph parted the womb when he was born, and the doctor handed my son to me, my Joseph, I still remember holding him in my hands. He's just a little guy. I lifted him up like this to the Lord in that room with my wife watching. This one shall serve the Lord. I still remember prophesying over my son, and this one shall serve the Lord. Would to God the more daddies would prophesy over their children. Would to God that more daddies would have that spiritual connection from the beginning with their babies. Zacharias lifted his son to the Lord and he said, you're going to be the prophet of the Most High. You shall go before him. You will prepare the way for him. You will give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. And so... When Jesus was bab baptized, he was validating Zacharias' prophecy over his son, John. And then in receiving water baptism, Jesus was identifying with sinful man. His baptism was a demonstration of man's sinfulness and need for a mediator. In Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So Jesus, our Messiah, is approachable because he is here understanding us and ministering. And that's why in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, he had said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. So he's approachable, identifying with sinful men, he had no sin himself, but identifying in order that we would know he would be able to be approached. Matthew records the story of how Jesus had been invited to his own house for a dinner. And as Jesus was at the table, there were sinners who came. They sat down with Jesus and his disciples, and the Pharisees saw it, and they were outraged. Matthew records that they were outraged because Jesus was eating with these kinds of people and they came and questioned his disciples, and they said, why is your master doing such a thing? Well, in Matthew 9, 12, and 13, when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Once again, the Lord is calling us who don't know him, we who don't know him, those who don't know him, he calls us to repentance. He said, I'm not coming to the self-righteous. They don't realize that they even need a Savior. I have come for those who recognize their great need for a, sa a Savior, which is what we did, right? It's what I did. When I said, God, have mercy, mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I'm miserable, and I, I make other people miserable by the way that I live and who I am. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 53, verse 12, that he was numbered with the transgressors. He was placed between two sinners. He identified with, with us. Well, in these ways, he fulfilled all righteousness. You see, after Jesus said, allow this to be so, it'll fulfill all righteousness, uh, John, John allowed him to be baptized. 
And in doing this, he revealed that he too is submitted to God. Well, in verse 10, immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Now, I'm just going to say this briefly. You'll see this. But Mark uses the word immediately something like 11 times in chapter 1 alone. And that's intended to reveal the fast pace of ministry of Christ as well as his obedience. And the Spirit descends upon him. And notice it's like a dove. That's been called the divine coronation of the Messiah. And the event gives us a picture of the Trinity because the Father speaks the Son is baptized, and the Spirit descends upon him. And that reminds me of uh, Christian baptism in Matthew 28, 19, where we're told, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because it says in verse 11, a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So the Spirit descends like a dove. In the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed to consecrate them to serve the Lord. And that was symbolic of Jesus' anointing for ministry. In Isaiah 61, 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners. In Acts 10, 37 and 38, you know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. Now, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And the Lord's ministry is to heal. The Lord's ministry is to preach those good, those good words to those who are spiritually impoverished, to be the brokenhearted, to be bound up, freedom for those who are captives to sin. This is what what we celebrate, you know, we're here in the 4th of July. We're celebrating the 4th of July as a nation. But the greatest freedom that I ever received was freedom from sin. My greatest freedom I ever received was the freedom God gave to me when he forgave me and gave me the liberty to follow Christ. And, and that's what Jesus Christ came to do, is to set us free. Well, as this is taking place, a voice, verse 11, came from heaven. You are my, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus, you are... My royal son, you are Messiah. You are the one in whom the Father delights. Isaiah 42, 1 says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. It, was, it had been pointed out that at every major point in his ministry, the spirit is at work. The Spirit is, a, is at work in his baptism. We'll see the Spirit at work in his temptation. We see the Spirit at work in his miracles. We see the Spirit at work in his resurrection. And so his Father says, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Those words were never said to any prophet. Prophets are servants, even friends. But Jesus is the only one ever referred to by his Father in this way. In everything he did, Jesus was well-pleasing to his Father. He always pleases him, he said. And that included his death on the cross. Isaiah 53.10 says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, ultimately, Jesus' sacrifice is the only one that ever fully pleased the Father. Jesus' baptism looked forward to the cross, but the believer looks back at the cross. He was immersed in the river of death that we might be partakers of the river of life. Jesus' obedience to the Father in receiving baptism is our example. His outward demonstration is an example to us of our own need for an outward demonstration. So Christian baptism, which we're going to celebrate today, Christian baptism looks back at the finished work of Jesus. According to Romans chapter 6, verse 3, 
When we are water baptized, we are actually being uh, baptized into his death. See, water baptism represents Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So when we were baptized or are baptized, we're totally identified with those events, death, burial, and resurrection. The word baptizo is the Greek word for baptizer, and it speaks of immersion. It represents our immersion in him and our taking on newness of life. When cloth would be dyed, say you had a white piece of cloth and you, had, uh, you wanted to uh, make it purple, you had a purple dye. You would take the white cloth and you would go to a vat. You would have the various things that needed to produce the color purple that could be used as a dye. And you would come and you would put that cloth in. You would leave it there for however long you needed it. And then you'd pull it out. And they would say at that time that the cloth was baptized. That was what the word means. It would speak about dyeing cloths and on. It was speaking of an immersion. And so you, when you get saved, you are immersed. It's a picture of your death, burial, and resurrection. When you go into the water, it's a picture of your death, dead and buried. When you come out of the water, it's a picture of your resurrection coming to life. So today, when we have our baptism, those who are baptized... When you go into the water, it's a picture of death and burial. There's one thing about funerals that every person who's ever attended one will know. That when that, the coffin is dropped into the grave and that dirt is put over it, there's a sense of finality. There's a sense that it's done. And I've been to... Many funerals, and that's exactly what you feel. You see the, the coffin placed into the, into the grave, and then that small bulldozer pushes the dirt in. It's tamped down. It's done. That's what happens when you're water baptized. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's been called an enacted drama. It's, it's, it's a picture of what's taking place. I was walking and, and dead in sins and trespasses without knowing it. But Jesus Christ came into my life, washed me, cleansed me, and gave me life. And now I've been born again. And because I'm born again, I follow Christ in baptism. Why? Because it's a symbol of what took place when I got saved. So I go in an outer demonstration, and I make it as a public witness so that people may know that I'm a follower of Christ. I step into the watery grave. I go down, and I come back up. I'm dead, buried, and I come back, and that's a picture of resurrection life. When I first got saved back, back in uh, 1970, and I went into the military, and I was there on, uh, at Fort Ord, and uh, Chaplain Clark, I still remember his name. Chaplain Clark was our chaplain, and I went and spoke to him, and I said to him, listen, I got saved, but I haven't had an opportunity to be water baptized. Could you baptize me? And he said, I would, and, and he would. And so I had two friends of mine that I made in basic training, and to these two friends, I said, could you come and be a witness to my baptism? And they said, yes. And so these two friends of mine came with me to this little chapel there on Fort Ord, and uh, Chaplain Clark put me in the water and brought me out. Death, burial, and resurrection before witnesses. I wanted them to know I was a follower of Jesus Christ, and that's what's going to happen today. There are going to be people who go into the pool, and they're going to lay down into it, if you will, and they're going to come out of it, and they're going to be recognized as dead, buried, before witnesses, but alive in Jesus Christ. And, and that's how it works in water baptism. It's an open symbol of your faith in Christ. It shows that the old man has been crucified with Jesus, and now we're alive in him. The Bible in Romans 6, verse 4 says, "...we were buried with him through baptism into death." Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. You see, John's was a baptism of repentance. They were to demonstrate that they recognized themselves to be sinners awaiting the Messiah, but you get water baptized because you received the Messiah. And so now that you've repented, there's a newness of life. Somebody, you, you should not, uh, uh, let's see, how can I put this? It's not the washing of, of the dirt from your flesh or else every day that you bathe or shower, you'd be rebaptized. That's not the point. The point of baptism isn't just washing dirt off the flesh. It's speaking of a new heart, a conscience that has been exercised towards the Lord. 
In Romans 6, it says in verse 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? In Galatians 5, 24 and 25, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So baptism demonstrates that we're buried with Jesus Christ. Christian baptism does. Again, we enter the water, we're immersed, death and burial. We exit the water, resurrection, newness of life. And the newness of life is a sign that we've been born again. Why? Because we have a new heart. In Ezekiel 36, 26, God says, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And because that's true, Ephesians 5, 8 says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the, in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Those of us who are believers, do your friends know that you're a believer? Those of us who have unbelieving parents, do your parents know that you're a believer? I can still remember, and I'm sure it's true to this day, how some parents reacted. I remember I was witnessing to a friend. I had gotten saved and witnessing to a girl I had met at a party. She was a friend. And she came walking by my house, and I hadn't seen her for a while, and she came walking by my house. I was at my parents' house, and, and she sees me, and you know I had met her before, visited with her before. And, and as we were speaking, she says, what have you been up to? I haven't seen you. And, and I said, you know what? I gave my heart to Christ. She says, what's that mean? I said, what's that mean? She goes, well, I'm a Christian. She was a Catholic, and she says, I'm a Christian. Well, she and I had been smoking pot and drinking together, so I thought, well, maybe, maybe you're not. So we talked about it. And as we shared, I said, let me tell you what God did in my life. And I began to share with her about Jesus and how he forgave me. And I asked her, have you ever received Christ? Have you ever asked God to forgive you of your sins? And she says to me, no, I, I never really have. What have you been relying on? Well, you know, I've been... I was baptized in this, and I said, well, you know, I understand that. I come from that background, but do you know I never gave my heart to Christ? I never said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I never said, God, I need to be born again, and I explained to her how, how that took place. I was a brand-new Christian. I wasn't a Christian two weeks yet, but I was already telling people, you need the Lord, telling my friends, telling my family, you need the Lord. And so she said, I, I want to know Jesus. And so I prayed with her. I still remember praying with her in the front yard at my parents' house. And then I said, you know, you need to get a Bible study. What do I know about teaching a Bible? I don't know anything. But I said, you know what, Let's co I'll come to your house and I'll read the Bible to you. And she says, okay, I'll never forget this. I went to her house. Now, this girl was, was you know, we were in a party. And that's the way it was. That's how it was with all of my friends. You know, let's get drunk. Let's get loaded. Let's be crazy. That's what we were. And now I'm saved. And she was crazy, too. And so I go to her house. I sit down with her in the front room, and, and I talk to her, and I open the Bible. I don't know anything. I said, let's just read it together. God can speak to our hearts. And she says, okay. So I read the Bible to her, and then she calls me, and she says, you can't come over anymore. And I said, why is that? She says, my mom doesn't want you at my house because she thinks you're crazy and you're bringing, uh, uh, bringing some cult stuff to the house. And that's how it's been. I had somebody in this church years ago, a young man who was into dope and the whole nine yards, into drugs and the whole nine yards, and he came forward at an invitation. And we got a call from the parents. The mother called, and she said, I could handle my son when he was on drugs. I can't handle my son as a Jesus freak. I don't want you near my son. You would be, perhaps you're not, but you would be surprised at the amount of people who would rather bury their children from drug overdoses than to see their life transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You would be surprised at how many people prefer their children to be lost in the world than to be people who have become Christians. You would be surprised. And so if you've given your heart to Christ, your life is going to change. People are going to see it. That's how my father came to faith in Christ. 
He said, I saw you and knew what you were before Jesus. He said, that's what spoke to my heart telling me I needed him. That's how it works. It's a way you live. It's a new way of life. It's not coming to church today and then going to some, some uh, restaurant and drinking your booze there. That's not walking in the spirit. That's walking in the flesh. And so the Lord would have us to live an entirely new way of life. Again, do our, do our friends and our family, do they know that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do, do they know that he is our Savior and he's the one that we live for? Do they know that? If not, then pray and seek the Lord and say, God, help me to be a good witness. And if you've blown it, guess what? God has grace and forgiveness. Receive it and move on forward. If you fall, fall forward. And watch what the Lord will do. I'm telling you that the church needs to wake up. It's not so much that we need a new president. What we need is a new person. We need people in the nation to live for Christ. That's what we need. That's, that's, what, changes, that's what changes everything. It's when we take our faith seriously and do those things that God has called us to do. He gives to us a new heart. He puts into us a new spirit. And our friends will look at us and, yeah, maybe they don't like us. You know what? Guess what? I wasn't liked before I got saved, and I'm not liked now by everybody. And that's okay because there's one person who not just likes me, he loves me, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's why I live for him. That's, that's why. And so we were once darkness, but now we're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And so in the ministry of John the Baptist, he came preparing a way for Messiah. Jesus came to him. John resists him insistently. I should be baptized by you, and, and, and you are coming to be baptized by me. Jesus said, suffice it for this time, for in doing so, it fulfills all righteousness. These things will be accomplished. He submits to him. And to Jesus, he baptizes him. The Spirit of God descends upon Jesus as the symbol that John had said, the one who sent me told me, the one whom you see the Spirit descending on and remaining, this is he. And Jesus Christ is later called the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. That was the ministry of John. After the ministry of water baptism through repentance, Jesus had his own baptism that his disciples would do on his behalf. That's found in John 4. And the people were coming to be baptized, symbolizing that they are now followers of Christ. And then ultimately, when Jesus died, buried, and was resurrected, he gave to the church the commission to go out into the world, preach the gospel, teach them all things that he has declared to us, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is called Christian baptism. And then you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, according to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and, and he makes you into the witness by empowering you by his powerful Holy Spirit, and then you, have, you go out in the power of God to bring the gospel of God to a world that needs God. And so John came preparing the way. He baptized Jesus Christ. Jesus submitted to it to fulfill our righteousness, demonstrating that he identifies with us as sinners and also that he was one obedient to the law and obedient to the directives of his father. And in doing so, John allowed himself, John allowed himself to be convinced to, to do that, and God gave that open witness, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Would to God that he would be able to look at me and to look at you and say, this is my beloved child, I'm well pleased. Father, we ask that you would work in our lives to such a degree that that would be something that could be said. I lift up our congregation to you, Lord, on this, this day that we celebrate the independence, the birthday, if you will, of this great and mighty nation. But I pray that, that we, your children, would live in such a way, Lord, that we would give pleasure to you, that you could say of us, I'm well pleased by you. So I lift up this congregation to you, those who are watching right now online. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would have your way in us. And even as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, there may be some right now who need to get right with the Lord. You may be in the overflow or watching online or in this room, and you need to get right with the Lord. I want to pray for you before we conclude. Maybe even give yourself to Christ today. 
And if you do give yourself to Christ and come back after second service, receive baptism. But if you need prayer right now and you need to be right with him, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Just raise your hand. Father, you see these hands. I thank you, Lord, for those whom you're speaking to right now that you are touching. And I ask in Jesus' name that you would minister to every person whose hand is raised. Father, we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you thanks. For, Lord, you are the God who makes all things new. You can wash and cleanse, and you can produce in us a heart, Lord, that is desirous of pleasing and following you. And so now I ask that you would work and that you would do such a thing. We give you praise, we give you thanks, we receive by faith, and we will walk by faith from this moment on. And we thank you, Lord. Bless you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Jesus, I ask that you keep moving in all of us to your glory in your name. Amen.